Uh, speaking of stanky up in here, I've got a brand that perhaps started off with some pretty good favorability factor that has devolved into something of uh, hate bait, if you like, Richard Mille. Uh, and the reason I, I refer to Sweat is because a lot of their watches are made with the express purpose of being incredibly rugged for, uh, for athletes, for them to be able to smash about in or do whatever it is that athletes do uh, without breaking. And, and I feel like the ethos of Richard Mille has been a bit diluted into the whole loud and proud crowd who like to buy expensive, colourful things and have them show off. And again, people are very entitled to do that. But there are, I still think, Richard Mill have some great, great watches in their lineup. One of the ones that really first clued me onto them was the Rafael Nadal RM027. And this took the tourbillon, a hallowed, delicate, very refined mechanism within watchmaking, the kind of thing that, oh, Patek Philippe have got a tourbillon and it's a very special watch. And they put it in a watch that he goes out and plays tennis in. Now like that, that, that to me is anti-establishment. It's saying precious complications, delicate watches, no. Check this out. Backhand smash. Yeah, exactly. This is the backwards cap wearing, skateboarding, cool kid doing the graffito tagging of watchmaking. Yeah with all of the uh, the traditional watchmakers going rah, 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 rah. It's got those expensive star-shaped screws on the... Oh, yeah. yeah. Not for conventional screwdrivers. Yeah, I, I, I think it's more to do with stopping people taking their watch apart at home because you need the special tool for it. So you have to take it in for a service. Yeah, you can't mod it or run pirated movements inside it. Exactly. But first of all, just, just look at it. And it's best looked at from an angle because that movement is as deep as it is wide. It's more like an engine block than it is a traditional movement. Traditional uh, watchmaking has always been about making movements very thin. Mm. And this is about making it deep and layered and architectural. There aren't any flat pieces. It all comes in at weird angles from all over the place. Uh, it's suspended from the corners to act as a suspension for the shock resistance to protect the tourbillon. And it sits in that deep engine bay in the tonneau case. And there's something about that, as someone who really likes cars and all sorts, something about that that's very, very appealing. And not only that, if, if this is a, uh, this is all about making a watch that's for sports people, they've, they've chucked in titanium, uh, lithium, aluminium, copper, magnesium, zirconium, all of these really, really light metals that are traditionally used in motorsport and aerospace. Uh, to make the movement, the movement by itself weighs just 3.8 grams. That's that's insane. And so that means that the watch itself, uh, with the magnesium and all those lightweight materials, weighs just 20 grams, including the strap. And that is less than a bag of crisps, or chips for our American friends. And you know how light those things are, because there's about three crisps in there and the rest is air. This is, this is less than that. My mum used to tape them to my wrist as well, so I wouldn't forget them um, when I went to school. <laughs> I know what a Richard Mill is going to feel like on the wrist. But yeah, if you want to know what it feels like, balance a bag of crisps on your wrist. Go play tennis. That's what it's like. That you're living the Rafael Nadal dream. Uh, but everything about this watch to me is what I like about watchmaking. It's a bit like the Hublot, but perhaps with more <laughs> reasoning behind it. I have, a, I have a, a goal they're trying to achieve. What do you think about that watch? Yeah, I'm a fan of Richard Mill. I think they're crazy. I mean, the, the one thing, my one complaint is readability, I suppose. Um, but I mean, that's the price you pay for having so much watch gore on offer. Just looking at this RM027, at the top you've got the mainspring barrel there and you've got the two bridges or arms. They're in the 10 to 2 position that they would be when you... <laughs> take a product shot of a watch so that's kind of confusing I, I almost glanced at that and thought that was the hands yeah it is a bit like that isn't it what's the time you look at the top no you look at the bottom no you look in the middle ah. <laughs> by which point the bus has gone yeah they're kind of receding into the mechanics of the watch there a little bit but um other than that like that's a small price to pay for for such majestic mechanical mayhem i will give it this on 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 wrist on wrist 
Um, the three-dimensionality of it, you don't rotate the thing and look square on. You look at a slightly steeper angle and the hands are raised above everything else uh, and they have brushed and polished edges. So they are actually more readable in the reels than they are in pictures. That's fair. Uh, but I, I, I have tried one of these on and it's a bit like that um, Ultiplano Ultimate Concept from Piaget, two millimeters thick. It's one of those experiences that has to be seen and felt to be believed. Yeah. Uh, and actually, it's it's not a huge watch. The way the, the case back, including the sapphire, is curved to hug the wrist, makes it feel like, as Rafael Nadal refers to it, as a second skin. It's actually a really nice... People say it's an expensive G-Shock. I like it. I would, I would happily own one of these if I had the capability to afford one. But from one reshot mill to another, I give you the RM69. Now, you, you, may, you may titter inaudibly at the number 69. <laughs> but there is a very real reason why they've picked this and uh, the reason why I'm showing this watch to you. Well, there's two reasons why I'm showing this watch to you. The, the first is, have you seen it? Wait, this is a luxury Swiss mechanical packet of love hearts. <laughs> exactly, exactly. This says, this says two things about the human race, I think. One, the fact that this watch exists and that someone has gone to the effort to make a mechanical mechanism that when you press the button, all three of those things spin round and it, it creates a, a unique phrase that could be inciting to any particular activity you may be up to although I'm sure it's not particularly romantic to be like, let's see what my watch says. The fact that that exists, I love that exploration. Again, the the pursuit of human imagination in all directions, I love it. It's like a safe space for experimentation where you go like, no one's gonna tell you off for making something stupid, just make it and let's see what happens, I like that. On the other hand, when something like this exists and costs so much money, it makes you think we're all doomed. Too expensive to buy, too dumb to die. <laughs> yeah, and there's something about the duality of the ridiculousness of this watch, of the intricacy of the mechanism, and it is an incredible mechanism. Now, if you know anything about watchmaking, moving objects that big and that relatively heavy is very difficult. And for it to have 69 hours of power reserve as well, uh, with all of that going on, is it, quite something. It is a, a special, interesting, and clever mechanism. It is also the stupidest thing I've ever seen. Yeah, I, can't, I I love the movement and everything, but the erotic sentiment is a bit weird. They they just got to sixty nine and they thought, well, we better do this then. There's nothing else we can do. <laughs> Which came first, the number of RMs they'd got up to, or the saucy idea that someone woke up with? Yeah. But yeah, I find it very I find it very unsettling to have a watch that. Uh, says, let me kiss you tonight on it. It's a little bit, little bit creepy. However, what I love about this watch is it's the spark of imagination that germinates into a whole tree of nonsense. Imagine this watch, right? Have you ever sat, have you ever sat down at a restaurant or you're thinking about a takeaway and you and your other half are, you can't pick. Imagine if your watch could pick for you. That'd be cool. You press a little button, whiz, 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 whiz. tonight you're having a pizza solved and it only cost many hundreds of thousands of pounds also there's a possibility of many 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 years down the line the rm420 <laughs> and it will say stuff like let's blaze it up or something like that <laughs> yeah you, you, in which form shall we consume this probably completely legal by that point substance gummies so what do you think it's, I, I think I had you with the first reshot meal. I may have lost you with the second. No, no, no. The, the first one I was just like, meh, cars. But this one, saucy messages, yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, you are, a, you are a sexy guy, as are we both. I mean, some people may think I'm a medium egg with a face drawn on it, but actually I'm quite the dish. <laughs> so, uh, hate bait or... Keep it in the good pile. Keep it in the good pile. I agree, and I disagree with anyone who disagrees with me. But they have their right to disagree with me, and I agree with that. Yeah, you should all agree to disagree. Right. From fun and exciting and unique watches to Daniel Wellington. <laughs> no, I think you've misunderstood. You're trying to persuade me. This is a bad start. 
or denial Wellington, as I like to call him, because he's living in a dream world. <laughs> dream world, DW, yeah. Don't wear. <laughs> Although the, the DW on the logo is round the wrong way. Um, I'm not sure if that's an homage to his origin story. I think his business started out as a lemonade stand and he used to <laughs> put the letters around the wrong way. <laughs> a lemonade stand? Please, mister, will you buy my watch? Actually, um, the origin story of Daniel Wellington is, is quite compelling. It's almost as good as uh, Bremont's. <laughs> Do tell. So Philip Tysander is a Swedish gentleman, entrepreneur, and he met an intriguing British gentleman while travelling the world called Daniel Wellington. <laughs> uh, did, he, did he meet him mid-hot air balloon flight or while he was walking his duck? He seems like a very uh, distinguished gentleman so far. Yeah, well, Philippe was in a canoe and uh, Daniel Wellington was running away from a boulder that was chasing him <laughs> out of a tomb. <laughs> True story. So inspired by this uh, British gentleman's impeccable style, Philippe decided to create his own line of watches. There were no steps in between that. That sounds like quite a leap. Yeah, travelling the world and he met a guy, liked what he was wearing and then rushed back home to Sweden and started a business. <laughs> and here we are. I, I like that. That is, a, that is the, the most potted of potted stories, isn't it? That's, that, that is up there with... Um, I had a dream about it, I heard it in the wind, and it was the headline of a newspaper. But you know, pe people are inspired by all sorts of things. Let's not knock it till we've tried it, the proof is in the pudding. What kind of a load of pudding is, is Daniel Wellington making? Well, I don't know what Daniel Wellington is inspired by. Uh, weeds? Uh, paper? Unflavoured ice cream? Yeah, so if we, if we have a look at the uh, classic Sheffield here, so this is a fairly typical Daniel Wellington watch. It's a dress watch. It's clean without being boring. Minimalist without being boring. It's very, very characterful. Uh, as Are these your words? I, I wanted to be devil's advocate and stay positive, but I just, I don't know. What do you think? Well, to, to take Daniel Wellington's words uh, himself, this minimalistic piece proves that simple does not necessarily mean boring. And what do they say about boring people? Something boring happened to them. Um, I do like a minimalist watch. Langer, uh, are an example of, of a company that make very minimal watches, Nomos as well, uh, both inspired by the same uh, Germanic approach. But they still use what they have to communicate some kind of creative thinking. This does feel very much like generic watch set to uh, the thinnest font. It's it's all kind of the same, isn't it? Yeah, it's too safe, it's too inoffensive, it's forgettable. It's like, I think being clean and minimalistic is very, very challenging. You know, simplicity is complexity resolved. It, it is a challenge to be able to do something that is that is very simplistic, but still characterful. Absolutely, yeah. And I feel like the character is definitely lacking from these pieces. Yeah, no, I, I'd agree with that. I don't. It's not horrible by any stretch. It's just forgettable. Yeah, yeah. It's the dial colour is referred to as eggshell white. Nobody chooses eggshell white, do they? That's just the that's just the colour the house comes in when you buy it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Styled after an empty flat. Taking inspiration from an abandoned warehouse. The watch is specifically tailored to look like it's just clean enough so you'll get your deposit back. Uh, one of the things I do find a, a little bit counterproductive in the design is the size of the logo. Daniel Wellington, the script is fine, but DW with the backwards D, which may indicate the thinking behind the brand, is it's just it's overwhelming. Like you said, it's it's a very uh, delicate thing to be able to add character to very small and minimal details. And there's maybe elements of, elements of that in the hands, the, the skinny start and then it, it winds up. It's a little bit like a, a, a JLC. Uh, but then, then the rest of it sort of disappears. And then you've got that DW hitting you right in the face. And this is something we've seen on a few of those brands. They're all about putting the name really large and I wonder if they hope that people see it and think, oh, that name sounds posh. This must be special. This is a, a common factor with these watch brands that are perhaps a little bit disliked is 
they lack any kind of identity or purpose they just seem to be coasting on what others have done before and that really comes through it just feels a little bit shallow and it just feels a bit exploitative people like a good origin story they like people that have sort of a scrappy and come from nowhere and have built themselves up and have got an idea and executed it really well but when you're even manufacturing the your origin story it just kind of feels cheap yeah like marvel films i will say this though in terms of hating the brand I don't really understand why people hate it because at first you'd have to feel something. Yeah. It's, there's nothing strong enough here to hate. Yeah, it's so inoffensive, isn't it? I think most of the hate stems from the fact that, I mean, you and I are on, on social media. Um, I think people get bombarded by this company on Instagram. Um, oh, fair enough. They're very um, uh, lifestyle image focused and um, they sort of paint that kind of picture. Oh, I see. So I think there's maybe a kind of... <laughs> millennial tie in there that people don't like I, I have the same hatred for uni pizza ovens oh it begins at a young age and grows slice by slice which won't leave me alone on youtube <laughs> that, yeah, that's your problem <laughs> i don't know what you're talking about there uh yeah but there are the, again there is a subset of people who want something minimal affordable that doesn't say too much and it's a timepiece fine i don't i don't lay any particular uh feelings of of bad will on those people at all no and you know what one of the redeeming features that could be said of all these brands is hey they might get people into watches these could be gateway pieces gateway brands you know people might stumble upon them and go hey that looks cool and then maybe a bit later on they might get a bit deeper into it into the the hobby and, and find and find that everyone hates their watch <laughs> yeah. they were tricked um, so, well, there you have it. Uh, five very hated brands, five very inconclusive results. Uh, what do you think? Do you do you hate on these brands as well? And, and if you do, tell us why. And, and if you don't, tell us tell us why not. Chances are most of you sensible people out there probably shrug your shoulders and say, huh, don't really care. And that is the spirit that we're going to end this show on. So until next time, viewers and listeners, I don't really care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for nothing. <laughs>